Oh, so here's the thing. We did not monetize our video. That means that everything from attracting viewers to our videos to making money off of them is not that to us. Why don't you do us a favor and tell your friends and family about our channel? Because we're sure that they know someone that will love our content. And since you're here, make sure you buy us a coffee at the link below. Each coffee brought done is three dollars to this channel. And all the money donated will go towards content on and off of this channel. Also on our Kofi page, check out our shop where you can watch the unedited versions of commercial breaks and buy cool merchandise we made ourselves. Mostly. And if that's not enough, what if we told you that those who gave to the channel will get a mention at the end of each video? So visit the link below and help support this channel through the power of a cup of coffee. And to those already donating, thank you for supporting the channel. And with that, let's begin. What's up everyone? For this video, we'll be taking you to the snowy ice caps of Antarctica. Now I know how you're going to react, but just hear Marcy out before you do so. Marcy? So today, we have for you a rare PB, a science documentary that did not originate from their flagship science proper, and follows the millions of people that are beginning to call the continent they had spoke of their home. Antarctica, the last continent, was produced in 1986 by environmentalist Michael Tobias for PB at San Francisco outlet KQ. And according to what we could find on the internet, size crew prowled the continent to meet up with the people looking to turn the place into the next national park, or such. But you know in the single hour Tobias has his crew meets up with the diver, the researchers. At the American Palmer base, scientists are studying krill, particularly its reproduction rates and mysterious whereabouts in winter. The physicist. In the fall of 1986, teams of American scientists came to McMurdo Station, where a decrease of as much as 40% of existing ozone had occurred in less than one month. The quote wires unquote of the place. Let's see what's going to happen in 1991. It doesn't mean that each country's claims won't be recognized. The student. Nine children now attend school at Base Esperanza. The tour guide. Vicky Varghese and Kate McWiggins are travel agents who promote environmentally sensitive tours. And the others looking to preserve the snowy land we call Antarctica. As with all but one of the programs on the tape this came from, this program was taped off of WTTW11, the PBS affiliate that serves Chicago. It is unknown when this very recording was made, but take it into account the other programs on here. We believe this was made a year or two after it first debuted on PBS. And that wraps up. Why don't you enjoy a bite of Beats Apple? No, for real. In this 15 minute version of the PBS Kids Science Program, the show's host, and to me, Science Friday's host, Ira Plato, takes a trip to SeaWorld in San Diego, where he swims with the penguins and directs the belugas. For now, though, Back from nearly 35 years of obscurity, here is, most, of Antarctica, the last continent. Acts as a barometer for researchers seeking to gauge the impact of biological and chemical changes elsewhere in the world. And global phenomena, like the greenhouse effect and the depletion of atmospheric ozone, are best studied in the relatively pure air of Antarctica. Ironically, this flurry of research activity has left its own mark on the landscape, and the small but growing tourist trade is beginning to affect the natives. For most travelers to Antarctica, the adventure begins here, at Ushuaia Harbor, nestled near the tip of Tierra del Fuego, Argentina. It is January, midsummer in the Southern Ocean, as passengers board the Bahia Paraiso for the 600 mile voyage through the Drake Passage, where the Atlantic and Pacific meet head on. This Argentine military support vessel will serve as home to an international collection of scientists and tourists. 
Some of the passengers are headed for remote scientific base camps. Others will be spending most of their time on board. I'm interested in a uh, beautiful landscape only for that reason. all over the world. So. For first-time visitors and seasoned hands alike, the passage is anything but dull. They know that the ship's sonar, radar, and other sophisticated navigational systems cannot guarantee their safety on this perilous course. It's very, very difficult. It's very, very dangerous. The ice, you cannot see it on the charts. They don't have lights. They may not be taken by the radar. So all of the high technology you have sometimes, it won't work through the ice and the icebergs. So we have to stand here looking at the bow, just as some navigators did 100 years ago. I feel the sea, I feel the, the wind. I can't imagine how they could feel in those small boats, wooden boats. In 1772, famed British explorer Captain James Cook set sail in search of the legendary southern edge of the world. And what he found staggered the imagination. The ice did not allow their ship the endurance to put ashore, but the voyage confirmed the existence of Antarctica, and Cook's euphoric descriptions of marine wildlife here brought a flood of other explorers eager to claim new territories for various kings and queens and to exploit living resources. A 4,000-pound elephant seal, easily killed with a spear, could yield two barrels of fuel oil. Its bulbous snout was also taken for food. Several whale and seal species were driven to near extinction, the plunder continuing well into the 20th century. But as whales and seals began to disappear, new priorities emerged for nations competing in the Antarctic. Political and scientific aspirations. Admiral Richard Byrd brought a new wave of technology to the southern continent, the airplane. He also kindled a vision of Antarctic colonization that would, in his words, get away from the false standards by which men live under more civilized conditions. Byrd established the first U.S. Antarctic base, Little America, at a time when Henry David Thoreau, author of Walden, was being rediscovered in the 1920s. For Admiral Byrd, Antarctica was like Walden Pond, a place of spiritual purity, where the explorer would be the first man to spend a winter alone in the frigid interior. Byrd continued to explore the continent into the 1950s, but World War II and the post-war era made it clear that international competition for territory and resources would not leave Antarctica a pristine haven for philosopher-scientists. The airplane has provided relatively easy access to the continent for thousands who have journeyed here. Today, most official visitors arrive on huge military aircraft, landing on one of the ice runways that are open in the summer. But the tourists still come by sea. The Bahia Paraiso will tour the 1,000-mile-long western peninsula, stopping first to resupply the Argentine Esperanza base, then continuing on a two-week odyssey to the U.S. Palmer Station. As the passengers prepare for their first landing, enthusiasm runs high. Will there be any place that we can ride on dog sleds or get off the boat and go skiing on the peninsula here? Yes, he's safe. The place realizes the fantasy. You've arrived at the place that makes you feel you've come home, and you've reached the end of where you can travel to, so you feel complete with what you've done. At midnight, with the temperature just above zero, passengers prepare to go ashore at Esperanza, in launches under the command of Argentine veterans of the Falklands War. 
It's remarkable that uh, these ships, that you can get on them and sail out of a place like Ushuaia and just take off and in two days be down in the world's most forbidding continent. The cost per couple for a trip from the U.S. to this remote outpost is about $12,000. Travelers will spend the night in small, comfortable cabins built by the Argentine Ministry of Defense. In the morning, the temperature will soar to 25 degrees. And since there are no tour guides in Antarctica, the travelers will head out on their own hiking above the base to visit penguin rookeries. While the penguins and seals are a photographer's delight, other animals that are rarely photographed play a vital role in the Antarctic ecosystem, a unique chain of life that may someday feed a hungry world. At Base Esperanza, French-Canadian scientist Jean-Claude Brett wants to know how the Antarctic marine environment operates so efficiently. This rare footage of a Scripps oceanographic expedition reveals the marine abundance of Antarctica. The footage was shot beneath the ice flows and shows edible scallops, glass sponges, sea spiders, anemone, and tube worms, as well as a new species of fish. Most of these animals have evolved their own organic antifreeze to allow them to survive nearly frozen seas. The temperature of the water here is colder than any place in the world but researchers have learned that it is anything but sterile. The southern ocean surrounding Antarctica accounts for the largest crop of edible organisms in the world, made up of single-cell diatoms, many of which are attached to the ice. When the ice melts, diatoms and plankton enter the food chain to be devoured by krill. It is the shrimp-like two-inch long krill that accounts for the extraordinary food potential in the southern seas. One super swarm sighted in 1981 was estimated to weigh five billion pounds. The harvest of krill from the southern oceans might produce as much food as all the world's fisheries combined. Many regard krill as an inexpensive high-protein human food, a potential solution to world hunger. At the American Palmer base, scientists are studying krill, particularly its reproduction rates and mysterious whereabouts in winter. I think our research suggests uh, that krill may, may be very productive in some areas of the Antarctic and less productive or non-productive in other areas of the Antarctic. So that uh, in regards to a fishery, one must exercise caution about where one fishes and potentially when one fishes in, in different areas of the Antarctic. If you take away the krill, a large portion of the Southern Ocean ecosystem is going to starve to death. Krill are central to the Southern Ocean ecosystem. They are eaten by all of the baleen whales, they're eaten by most of the species of seals, they're eaten by many of the species of penguins, they're eaten by many of the seabirds. Thus, the food chain of the Antarctic stretches from the microscopic diatom to krill, and then to the larger sea mammals and birds. 
the one creature that is totally dependent upon krill is the penguin. Scientists have been studying penguins for decades, but the seven Antarctic species of penguin do not yield easy answers to key questions. How is it, for example, that penguins have adapted so well to such harsh conditions in both sea and on land? These emperor penguins actually fast for 145 days during the mating season, standing all day through the long, bitter winter. There are two eggs nestled under their webbed feet. No other organism endures such adversity. Researchers have yet to unravel another mystery of penguin behavior their ability to travel thousands of miles through the icy seas and return to mate on the same pile of rocks where they were born five years before. No one is certain where these penguins go to spend their dark winter, and while there is no exact measure of their intelligence, they appear to be as curious about humans as humans are about them. We're used to dealing with creatures that are solitary or live in small groups that we watch through telescopes, binoculars, or microscopes, and just sit in the middle of a colony of several thousand wild organisms behaving naturally is it's really a unique experience down here. It's one of the things I really enjoy about working with penguins and working in the Antarctic in general. The wildlife down here is just not afraid of people. Dr. Mark Chappell and colleague Sherry Sousa are American scientists in the Antarctic, studying the impact, not of cold, but of heat upon penguin physiology. Okay, 39.2. Here, they are recording a chick's temperature by sticking a heat-sensitive wire down its gullet. This does not seem to upset the chick, which is accustomed to receiving masses of regurgitated krill from its parents in much the same manner. Wayne and Susan Trivalpiece have been coming to the Antarctic for nearly a decade to study three species of penguin that nest side by side. Dr. Trivalpiece works for the Point Reyes Bird Observatory in Northern California, but he can often be found recording and analyzing penguin data or immersed in the midst of a raucous colony. I think what draws me back here for so many years, uh, they really are right at the heart of the problems down here and, and at understanding the whole system here. There are so many of them and they are the key predators on the krill, which is becoming a very central issue as a food source for man. And much of the work we're doing now, although we're interested primarily in comparing the three species and learning more about them, the work that we're gathering information on will be useful in the future as a sort of a backdrop or a, a guideline, a, a benchmark, if you will, at this point in time that may be used uh, very much in the future when man starts harvesting krill. While penguins mark their territorial boundaries with small stones, they are not aggressively protective. Their ferocious shrieks can be heard miles away, but they allow observers to come within a few feet of their nest. It is believed that adult penguins mate for life. This group of three-week-old furry brown newborns is watched over by several black and white babysitters. The young adults will not mate until they are four or five years old. The baby penguins will be on their own within two months. What little scientists know about penguins is based on their behavior on land. But penguins spend most of their time lounging on icebergs or in the water, gorging themselves on krill. Today, these peaceful creatures must compete with another species for the food they eat. At least six nations are currently harvesting krill, and many multinational corporations are eager to exploit other Antarctic resources, like oil, gas, and mineral deposits. 
The International Antarctic Treaty is up for review in 1991. And many analysts worry that if the continent's resources are not adequately protected, the future of this continent is bleak. And there is an even greater threat that is literally looming over Antarctica. A hole in the atmospheric ozone that may pose a threat to all life on the planet. The Earth is surrounded by a protective shield of ozone, a layer of the atmosphere roughly 10 miles up that acts as a filter against the sun's deadly ultraviolet radiation. These recent satellite photos of the South Pole paint an ominous picture. They indicate that the ozone layer over Antarctica is mysteriously dissipating. What we have learned is that uh, the ozone hole, in fact, is not a hole at all, but a cavity. There's only a region, and if I want to, I'd rather use miles maybe for this discussion. It starts at about eight miles and ends at about 13 miles. So it's only about a five mile thick region. And the size of it is roughly of continental proportions. It is an Antarctic phenomenon where the temperatures remain the coldest. In the fall of 1986, teams of American scientists came to McMurdo Station, the main U.S. Antarctic base, where a decrease of as much as 40% of existing ozone had occurred in less than one month. The data collection which began in August of 1986 when the ozone hole was at its worst involved a series of balloon-borne and ground-based atmospheric experiments. If you sit on the ground and look up at ultraviolet, you can detect the total amount of ozone above you. So these measurements suggest that it's been going down each year in October, but they don't say where in the atmosphere it's going down. Uh, the balloon measurements sample as the balloon goes up. And what we have learned is that it's not just a void, and it's not a smooth reduction. What we've learned, and completely unexpected just in the last two or three weeks, is that uh, the depletion occurs in small sub-regions. Uh, the best e example I can give is that it looks like Swiss cheese, the, this cavity. It's got holes in it where there's almost no ozone at all. Theoretical work will be much more difficult, I think, now in, in explaining these things. I've got all my gas stuff on, you know? Yeah. It really doesn't work. Okay, if you're not too cold, then I'd like to go for a couple of more. Susan okay. Solomon, leader of the ozone expedition, is analyzing sunlight with a spectrometer to better gauge the interaction of 15 molecules that play a critical role in the chemistry okay, of ozone good. formation. Um, let's go ahead then. I guess we'll take uh, a couple of blues, take three blues, and then a couple of reds. Okay. A team from the Pasadena Jet Propulsion Lab is also collecting sunlight using an interferometer. Scientists are trying to determine whether the ozone hole is the product of a meteorological fluke or the byproduct of man-made chemical pollution. Okay. So everything looks real good. The search for answers will continue next August when a lone pilot from NASA will fly this ER-2 jet across the Antarctic continent at an altitude of over 12 miles, the upper ceiling of the ozone hole. There, the ozone depletion will be monitored by equipment on board. It is a dangerous but crucial mission. It's really extremely significant. About three years ago, nothing was known about this. Uh, suggests that uh, the environment is not uh, something that should be taken lightly. I think should be a lesson to everyone that we really need to uh, be keeping a close watch on things like this. The National Cancer Institute estimates that if a similar ozone hole appeared over the United States, the incidence of skin cancers through exposure to ultraviolet radiation could jump 80% over current rates. Recently released data indicates that two other ozone holes are now forming over the Arctic and the tropics. 
Scientists are now linking the ozone problem to another problem known as the greenhouse effect. Carbon dioxide and other byproducts of fossil fuel combustion have formed a blanket in the atmosphere, causing the temperature of the Earth to rise about two degrees every 15 years. If the current trend continues, sea levels could rise some 20 feet, flooding many coastal cities. The ice itself absorbs many pollutants, including some which may cause ozone depletion. And scientists believe that if the greenhouse effect accelerates, much of the previously absorbed pollution will be released into the atmosphere, which would in turn expand the ozone hole farther. Solutions to the problem won't come easily, but research offers hope. Antarctica has become an early warning system for global environmental threats. And it may also serve as a model for political and scientific cooperation. For winter. And there are also a lot of visiting scientists. There are four Americans, three Belgians, two West Germans, and a Russian. 35 nations are now members of the 1959 Antarctic Treaty, which comes up for probable review in 1991. Treaty members have agreed to keep nuclear weapons and waste out of the Antarctic, to protect native plant and animal species, to impose a moratorium on any new territorial claims to the continent, as well as opening their scientific stations to anyone. Here at the Polish Arktowski base, Scientists from half a dozen nations, including the U.S. and Russia, are currently cooperating on several biological experiments. The treaty has thus far engendered a uniquely amicable arrangement between nations. But many questions must be resolved before the treaty comes up for review in 1991. Tucker Scully is America's Antarctic representative at the State Department. And those basic political differences in 1959 and remain which mean essential elements of the differences today are the question of whether sovereignty exists, whether there are claims to sovereignty in, in Antarctica. Seven countries claim sovereignty to pieces of the continent. The rest of the countries that are active neither recognize nor make such claims themselves. The United States does not claim territory in the Antarctic, but several nations do. Argentina, Great Britain, and Chile each claim the most valuable stretch of land on the continent, the Western Peninsula. La apuesta de una determinada cantidad de explotación eh, como... In terms of the treaty, let's see what's going to happen in 1991. It doesn't mean that each country's claims won't be recognized. And if Antarctic resources like petrol are found to be extensive, there will be enough for everybody, and it should be easy to organize the gains for all countries. Argentine Defense Secretary Alfredo Mosso traveled to his country's Antarctic bases in 1987. While the treaty forbids military actions in the Antarctic, it does sanction military logistical support of the scientists there. The military presence in Antarctica has hastened the process of its colonization. In 1978, the Argentine Navy brought a pregnant woman to base Esperanza, where she delivered the first baby on the continent. Argentina saw this as a way to increase the legitimacy of its territorial claims. Nine children now attend school at Base Esperanza. Argentina was also the first country to promote tourism on the ice. Today, that country controls the largest number of bases in the Antarctic and speaks openly of sovereignty there. Sovereignty means ownership, and ownership in the Antarctic could translate into great wealth. Hundreds of Earth scientists, some contracted by private enterprise, are in the Antarctic. These three Argentine scientists are probing a relatively unsurveyed region in the Western Peninsula. So far, 15 different Antarctic minerals have been discovered, including gold, silver, platinum, and uranium. Aerial surveys have facilitated the discovery of large coal deposits and enough iron in just one mountain to supply the world for 200 years. 
Because of similarities between many Antarctic rock formations and mountains rich with resources elsewhere in the world, high hopes for Antarctic mother loads have been stirred. You'll see people rushing down to Antarctica to try and determine exactly what's there and how much and whether or not they could ever com commercially exploit those. In the early 1970s, an American vessel found strong evidence of petroleum in three of the four holes it had drilled. The U.S. Geological Survey has projected deposits of 45 billion barrels of oil in the Antarctic. There are three oil companies on the American Antarctic Advisory Committee. And treaty nations have thus far conducted often acrimonious negotiations on the question of resource ownership, as well as environmental impact. There are those who would have looked at the North Slope of Alaska or looked at the North Sea even a number of years ago, a number of years ago, and been incapable of imagining that resource activities could take place in such areas. So I think one has to be prepared. One has to envisage the possibility of such activities. While many countries are exploring the possibilities, no known oil exploitation has yet occurred. Nor does drilling appear economically feasible in this century, say analysts. But many people are worried. If the Antarctic Treaty expires and each country starts to make its own decisions, well, there will be great confusion, conflict for sovereignty, commercial exploitation. That would be very sad. What primarily is being looked at right now is offshore oil and gas. I think it's safe to say that any oil that would be spilled there would be very difficult to ever be contained or cleaned up. We all know that, that the impact of oil on birds, for example, is catastrophic, as was seen in the Santa Barbara oil spill. And there's another problem. Unlike successful oil exploitation in the Arctic, Antarctic exploitation would have to cope with gigantic icebergs that can move 40 miles a day mowing down any offshore oil rig in its path. While issues associated with energy exploitation may be resolved in the future, there is a growing problem on the continent today that few people seem willing to address. Antarctica is becoming a garbage dump. At Base Esperanza, the dumps are scattered directly in the middle of one of the largest penguin colonies in the world, right on the water's edge. At other bases, garbage is sent out on icebergs or detonated. Only the New Zealanders take their garbage home. I don't think there's uh, any need for a panic that we, we have irreversibly harmed the um, pristine environment. If one looks at what it takes to run a station, one of the basic problems is heating, fuel for heating, fuel for generating electricity. And that has to all be brought in from the outside. Now there are a lot of risks in terms of bringing in fuel oil, either by land or by sea. Millions of gallons of diesel fuel are brought to the bases every year, along with large quantities of plastic, rubber, metals, and organic toxins, none of which will ever leave this continent. Dozens of ships traveling to the bases contribute their own pollution and garbage, which is often just thrown overboard. As many as 4,000 scientists and support personnel are now routinely traveling to the Antarctic by ship. Once anchored, a ship's bilge tanks typically are pumped, sending oil waste out across the water, where seals and penguins, fish and other life forms are likely to be afflicted. Because of their simple and short food chain, animals in the Antarctic are particularly vulnerable to pollutants. And despite their distance from the industrialized world to the north, several Antarctic bird species, including penguins, have shown heavy concentrations of DDT in their tissues and eggs since the 1940s. There are some studies which show PCB contamination off of uh, Japanese base, I and mean, a number of studies which show um, quite significant pollution problems. Um, I think this is something that needs to be addressed in a larger context. How local are those uh, problems? We don't know. Well, it is inevitable that uh, the ships coming always have some kind of effect on the environment. There are always some kind of leaks from the motorboats used to land people. 
Argentine scientists are just beginning to inventory pollution in the Antarctic, like slow leaks from oil drums at Brown Base, where a scientist with cabin fever went crazy and burned the base down. At one time, McMurdo Base actually maintained a nuclear power plant. It broke down after a few years, and under terms of the treaty, which bans nuclear wastes on the continent, tons of radioactive soil were shipped far out into the ocean and dumped. I worked there for a number of years. I was appalled at uh, the way some of the stations are conducting their business. And I think that you haven't even seen the full impact of it. U.S. taxpayers spent $117 million in 1986 for America's four principal Antarctic bases. Most of the money went for maintenance and logistical support. Only $10 million was earmarked for research and considerably less for environmental impact studies. Antarctica's coastline is 18,000 miles long. But the ice-free regions, where nearly all the plants and animals live, comprise a mere few hundred miles. And these are the areas where the bases are built and tourists congregate. There is inevitable conflict. Flights by helicopters or aircraft could be quite disruptive. If you could cause a mass panic, the adults would all leave their nests, run to the water. Um, if they were on eggs, a lot of eggs would be broken. More importantly, they'd be exposed to attacks by skuas and perhaps other predators. If you had a lot of young chicks, they could be trampled, they could be injured or killed that way. Um, even if the chicks were relatively old, just the mass confusion could permanently separate chicks from their parents, and if that happened, the chicks would die. So there's plenty of potential for real problems if you have even a single low flight by a helicopter or an airplane. Vicki Varghese and Kate McWiggins are travel agents who promote environmentally sensitive tours. One of the first bases that we went to, we all came off the ship, went immediately to the penguin rookeries, and there was no one guiding us. We were on our own, and as a result, several people went right into the rookery area, um, and one child actually even stooped down and picked up one of the penguin babies. The people actually got a kick out of seeing these birds being afraid and running from them. The adults are as bad as the kids. The adults come in wanting to get the perfect picture of a bird nest. They get within six inches of, of parents sitting on eggs. The current Antarctic Treaty orders all scientists and base personnel to protect plants and animals. And in the U.S., Congress ratified the 1978 Antarctic Conservation Act, which imposes stiff fines for violators. Michael. If a, a, a United States citizen were found intruding on an area that was specially protected or violating uh, the bird life or the mammal life that, that was in the area, that uh, they would be reported and fines would be levied. U.S. tourists and base employees are asked to abide by these rules. But there are no police in the Antarctic, and other nations lack such rigorous laws. Tourists have been coming to the Antarctic for 30 years, as many as 60,000 of them so far. Today, there's an all-out boom taking place here. And Argentina seems eager to capitalize on the trade. When trying to get the first hotel in the Antarctica, really we have now little houses in Marambio. But in Esperanza, we'll try to get one hotel 
small hotel, 30 rooms, 60 bed. That will be the first hotel. It's the beginning of the new age in our country. Now the biggest impact for me is actually the tourists. Uh, a shift comes in about once every week while I'm here. And for the better part of a day every week, I'm donating my time to instruct people and keep them out of parts of my study area and, and also try to teach them something about what's going on down here. So it cuts into a lot of my research time. More worrisome are recent studies that indicate disastrous declines in the number of penguins at rookeries adjoining scientific bases. But it's not just tourists who can cause problems. There used to be a thriving rookery here, atop Base Esperanza. But scientists let their huskies roam freely, even though they were killing off thousands of penguins. These two chicks and their mother are all that remain. I don't see much concern for, way, for the way the bases impact the environment. Um, either the people who are there for maintenance and construction or even the scientists in a way. If the people at the bases don't even control their own environment, um, then they're certainly not going to keep the tourists from invading it as well. The scientists themselves will be the first ones to tell you, hey, we don't want that impact. We want the environment in its pristine state. Or we can't even study that. Maybe a couple people to help at the landing when we get there in about five minutes. Roger. The Antarctic Treaty has set 20 biological sites off limits to tourists. At the American Palmer Base, even Don Wiggins, chief of operations, has difficulty gaining access to certain protected rookeries. This year, um, there really is no research carried on the island. All research has to be done by permit. In fact, all visiting has to be done by permit. Uh, even for my own work on the island, which is we maintain a survival cache, um, actually maintain signs that um, identify the island as a specially protected area. I have to have a permit, and you know, members of my staff who go to the island have to have a permit, and they're severely limited. Increasing the number of protected areas might be a partial solution to problems in the Antarctic, but many people are advocating more comprehensive measures. I think we need to have this set aside as a national park or some type of restricted area um, where humans and the animals can coexist, um, neither damaging the other. I think that's what we really need to do. The environmental organization Greenpeace has just set up the first non-governmental base on the southern continent. Greenpeace wants to monitor environmental impact and publicize the concept of an Antarctic World Park. Such a proposal was set forth by New Zealand back in 1975. So far, several million people from 38 countries have signed an Antarctic World Park petition. Millions of people all over the world have begun to call for a world park. We have petitions which show this, and these are people who've never been to Antarctica. We are captivated by this idea of this continent existing, which is a, a haven for wildlife and for scientific cooperation. We believe that the world park solution is the only solution to keeping Antarctica in that state. If we reach a stage where really serious scarcities develop with respect to various kinds of minerals, one of the dangers I would see in, in the World car Park kind of approach would be that there might, that might collapse under 
sort of a, uh, not a hysteria, but at least a you know, very strong desire to look at last sources of, of resources. And one might have a situation in which there would be a stampede of some sort for resource development in Antarctica with no controls. The Antarctic World Park would be something that would close off the minerals option, something that will encompass all of the, the important guiding principles in Antarctica. I'd like to see the place left alone. I'd like to see it preserved as much as possible, not just for research, but just because it's such a special place and unique in the world. Every place needs to have a few sanctuaries set aside, places where you can go and, and see how it was and see it unspoiled. Um, it's maybe hard to think of things like that in the Antarctic where everything looks so unspoiled yet, but it wasn't too many hundreds of years ago that it was like that in the U.S., for instance. And if some of our forefathers didn't have the foresight to put you know, together national parks and such, we wouldn't see those today. It's important for people. I think it, their hearts are calling out for some place left on this earth that is untrampled by humans. And we think that place is Antarctica. Today, Antarctica remains essentially unspoiled, with thousands of dedicated individuals working to safeguard its future. This southern continent is more than just another frontier to be conquered. It is the purest, least understood region on Earth. Antarctica calls out to future generations, inviting not exploitation, but humility and wonder. Now, here's a bite from Newton's apple. It may not look like California, but this frozen penguin paradise is actually a huge refrigerated room at SeaWorld in San Diego. Here you can find over 300 penguins of seven species. There are chin straps, rock hoppers, adelies, kings, and of course the regal emperor penguins. Now normally to see penguins like these, you'd have to go to Antarctica. But with such a hostile climate down there, there are more people at a ball game on a sunny day than have ever been to the frozen south. One man who goes to Antarctica every year to study penguins is Dr. Frank Todd. He helped create the SeaWorld penguin colony so he can study their behavior all year round and let us enjoy them as well. Well, let's talk about what we're seeing here. A penguin is a bird, right? That's and correct. one just happened That's to correct. walk up here. That's correct. This is Tut. This, yeah. is... <laughs> this is a king penguin. And uh, penguins, of course, have the one feature that is unique to all uh, birds and only birds, and that is the presence of feathers. And you can see these feathers are a little different than most mm. birds. You can see that they are overlap, uh, very much like uh, scales or shingles on a, on a roof, uh, creating a very, very uh, uh, tight uh, uh, skin, so to speak, on the outside where they trap a layer of warm air between the feathers and, and the skin itself, and that keeps them warm, and they're able to survive now in water temperatures of 28 degrees. And in air temperatures even colder. Oh, than yes, that. absolutely. But, the, but it's in the water where they would be tending to, to lose most of the body heat, you see. And one of the things you've also recreated from Antarctica is the vast amount of, of water, a lot of water. They live in the ocean, right? right. Right. The, this pool, for example, is 150,000 gallons, so it's a massive pool. And they are birds that spend most of their time in the water, as we mentioned a, a moment ago. And you can see that their, their wings have obviously modified into, uh, into flippers. They look like they're flying they're Extremely the powerful. They do fly in the water. They fly out of the water, actually, when they're porpoising. Uh, in the case look of, the, of yeah. the large guys, yeah. unbelievably, they can dive to depths almost reaching 900 feet. 900 feet. Stay down for almost 20 minutes. Now, if any physiologist will tell you, with a bird, that's obviously impossible. Right. But fortunately for us and for them, they just don't read the same books that we do, you see. 
And you've recreated uh, here what really looks like, and I've been to Antarctica, and you really do get a feeling of what the penguins are like down there. Now, I know down there they have real, no natural enemies here on, on the ice, right? They're very friendly to you, just as they are. But in the water, they have, uh, well, they, they go in to eat, as you say. Right, right. Uh, they are, of course, a flightless bird. Right. Uh, which means that they're not going to do well in areas that have a terrestrial predators, like, say, polar bears or arctic foxes and things of this sort. But this doesn't mean that they're not subject to some degree of predation. They have skuas, which are, are gull-like birds that prey on them as eggs and chicks. And, of course, leopard seals and killer whales and things of this sort. But that's in the water. At least they have a chance yeah. there, you see. Yeah. Now, you've done something unusual here. You've had the first birth of an emperor penguin, That's right? correct. The emperor penguin is, is an extremely interesting animal in that it's a winter nester, nests in the middle of the Antarctic winter. And keep in mind now, seasons south of the equator are reversed. And the male uh, of the emperor penguin, for example, does all the incubating. This is 64 to 67 days. He sits on an egg? Uh, the egg is actually balanced on the top of its feet. And that is the territory, and they're mobile. They can actually shuffle around with this egg on their feet. And all, that's all through the wintertime. Exactly. And exactly. the wind may be raging outside. 100 miles an hour, 100 degrees below zero, dark 24 hours a day, and they're on the sea ice. They don't even come ashore, meaning that they may be the under, only bird under normal conditions that never comes to dry land. Well, let's talk about that, because one of the unique things about your uh, penguins here is that you actually breed them here, too, yes. right? Yes, we've been able to develop the techniques to breed these, these highly specialized uh, birds from the far south, and I think we have a tape uh, of an actual hatching that you might be interested in seeing. Let's go look at that. Here we see a pair of emperor penguins, and the male, of course, is still incubating the egg on the top of its feet, and it, at this stage, is beginning to hatch, and this oh, has taken some... Uh, 64 to 67 days, so he's been on it for really quite uh, Egg just sits there on the feet. Exactly. And here the chick now is actually emerging, and this is something you would not see in the, in the wild because of the long, dark, cold, inhospitable winters. And, and how long would the chick sit there? Well, the, the chick is now brooded on the top of the feet for uh, six to seven weeks, maybe a little longer. Mm -hmm. And you can see at this stage, it's, it's really quite helpless, and it depends on the presence of the adults to make sure that it's going to get food and warmth and things of this sort. And these, these two chicks, uh, K.O. and the kid, which we hand-reared in 1960, or 1983, represent the first time that this species has ever been hand-raised in captivity. Looks so small. Well, at yeah. this stage, they are pretty helpless. And, of course, uh, we can't feed them via regurgitation. That is to say, uh, upchuck uh, uh, food like an adult would. So we have to come up with a, uh, a formula, which we call penguin milkshake, which is... <laughs> pre-digested protein and krill and all these kinds of things. But and, how, it, and how long do you feed them? Well, in the case of, of the emperors, it's several months before they go on to solid food. What do they eat? Well, in the wild, they feed mainly on krill, which is a small shrimp-like crustacean, as you know. They feed on fish and squid. Here, they're fed mainly fish. Mm -hmm. And you have this colony here to study them scientifically, right? Well, uh, to provide the means to, to accomplish science, that's true. Also to propagate them, that is to say, to, to breed them. But also to carry out work that re will relate uh, down the road to conservation. Now, while most penguin species are not endangered now, they're extremely vulnerable, mm -hmm. which means that they are in a position uh, to be threatened down the road. So what we'd like to do is to gather enough information about them now, before they're in trouble, that might be applicable later to uh, uh, management programs that we might have to put into effect to protect them and make sure that they're going to be here forever. This curious looking animal looks a lot like a dolphin, but it's really a close cousin, a whale. In fact, both of these beluga whales come from the icy waters of the Arctic North. Fortunately for us, they live now at the Minnesota Zoo, a lot easier place to visit them. Well, we went to the zoo where our colleague Nancy Gibson helped us to get to know these whales better. Now, beluga whales are small toothed whales, mm -hmm. and these two we caught in the Hudson Bay. Mm -hmm. And over here, wanting a little attention, is Big Mouth, so aptly named. Oh, I can see why, yes. Now, Big Mouth weighs, oh, about 1,700 pounds, and he's about 14 years old. And over here is Little Girl, and she's a little younger, about nine years old, and also grayer. They're grayer when they're younger. Oh, and she girl. weighs about, oh, 1,100 pounds. One of the reasons we came to the zoo was to find out how difficult it is to take an animal from the wild and keep it alive and healthy in captivity, especially a large marine mammal. Nancy told us the whales need lots of personal attention. A whale keeper has to give the animals everything they normally get in the wild. Mm. And today I'm going to teach a little bit about being a whale keeper. Oh, okay. What do we do first? Well, you'll take that white jug there. This one? Yep. Fill it all up with water here. All right. And we're going to take it downstairs and 
Test for a variety of things and see how your skills are at chemistry. All right. Okay. The water the whales live in has to be just right. The half million gallon tank is recycled and filtered every 90 minutes. A daily water sample is tested for harmful organisms that might infect the whales. It's tested for pollution and has to be just the right temperature. And since whales live in salt water, the salinity has to match. Now, most of the time we want the water to be about 2% salt water. Uh, but during breeding season, we like, we're trying a test where we're going to lower it to about 1%. What we're trying to do is simulate uh, the river water that whales would encounter during breeding, breeding season. They like to breed in the, in the you're rivers. You're right on the mark, 1%. Okay. Now that we knew the water was in good shape, it was time to learn how to feed a whale. First of all, you're going to have to weigh out two pounds of mackerel. Uh, Nobody likes to eat frozen fish, and neither do whales. The fish in the wild are a lot tastier. So, to make the meals more appetizing, whale keepers vary the amount and type of fish the whales eat. And since frozen fish loses some nutrients, a vitamin pill is hidden in one of the fish. Two more pounds of herring. Hey, you're pretty good at this. I think I got a future in fish marketing here. Yes, you do. <laughs> you wouldn't call the whales light eaters. Big Mouth gets about 50 pounds of fish a day. Little Girl gets about 28 pounds. Okay, now here comes the good part. Oh boy. All right, now this is his food, and that's her food. Now don't interchange buckets here. All right, I'll be careful. All right, you guys, dinner time. First of all, let's greet them a little bit. We really like to sort of you stick your hand down in front. Oh, right in there. You can see their <laughs> little teeth. Not to really worry about. Why don't you give her a little rub? Right down in front. Ooh. Interesting How are thing you? about their mouths, yeah. they have all their senses centered in there. Sort of acts like their hand. So that's really how they greet us then. Right. And there's one theory that they have a lot of their they have very well developed <coughs> taste buds. So they're actually kind of seeing who you are by what you taste like. Okay, I'm gonna give them a cue here. What you might have noticed about one these whales, they don't have the dorsal fin, which no, is one of the peculiarities. Yeah. If you will hold your hand over here and give her, no, the other hand. The other hand. All cues go with your right hand for her and left hand for him. I'm going to give him the cue of this. Okay, this. Mouth. Can I get your dorsal ridge? Come on. Roll over. There we go. What he's going to show us right here is his dorsal ridge, which is a hard calloused area, and they use that for breaking oh, I see, through. Yeah thin layers of ice up in the Arctic waters. They don't have a dorsal fin like other whales do. Okay, let's show some other behaviors here. All right. All right, you guys. You ready to work? Are you ready to work? <laughs> okay, now these animals are known as the sea canaries. Sea let's, canaries. Yeah, let's see if we can get them to do some songs, okay? Let's hear. Come on, let's hear. That's good. Now these noises are coming through their blowholes. Mm -hmm. Oh, listen to variety that. Variety of noises. Mm -hmm. Now, you might notice that his melon and her melon on the bulbous area on top of their mouth, on top of their head, is actually moving. Now Very they, prominent area, you know. Right. Now, they will use that area to do some of their echolocation from underwater. And that's just air moving around in the nasal passages and it's projected out throughout that melon area. Fascinating. Fascinating. Well, you think you're ready to be a, a whale trainer I here? I think I'm ready. Okay, what I'm, I'm going to have you do train. is a breach or a leap out of the water. You want me to do it? You're going to do it. I'm going to get them to get the leap? <laughs> right. Okay, sure. I want you to station them here. <laughs> All right. Try that, and then I'm going to have you move both your hands to the outside direction. Do that fast. The outside direction. Right. Okay. Ready? Okay, now station them. Get them over here. Get them over here. All right. All right. Send them on out. Hey, look right, at that. Now you take this pole here. That's called Grab their the target. Pole. Yeah. And put it about the center of the pool. A little Gee, higher. I feel like a real, <laughs> real, a real keeper little here. Higher, little higher, little higher. There hey. you go. <laughs> now we're going to get a little wet. There. All right. That's Whoa. called the breach. Now, a breach is something they actually do in the wild. Oh, really? And they'll do that to rid their body of parasites, a little displaying. And uh, also just to keep an eye on what's going on. Very right? good, folks. Very good. You made good. me look great on television. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Unfortunately, I think we're out of time. We have to say goodbye, Nancy. Oh, I'm going to steal your cue. Come on, you guys. Let's have you say goodbye this time. Come on. There. Look at them. They're waving their flippers. <laughs> Newton's Apple is made possible by a grant from DuPont, makers of better things for better living, and also by this station and other public television stations.